Welcome back, everybody, to the Philosophy of Art and Science podcast. As always, if you want to support this program, you can go to aksum.substack.com. That's A-K-S-U-M dot substack.com. You can also go to patreon.com slash tawahado. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash T-E-W-A-H-I-D-O. My guest today is Delton Davis. Assalamu alaikum. Tudo bom? And then, to the band, well, I come salam. And Xavier Muskin. Then, then, Xavier Muskin. So, um, Delton and I have a number of interests that overlap, whether it's, you know, Christianity, whether it's teaching, whether it is languages. And so he's a, he's a very cool cat who happened to, to be a ex-roommate of a couple cats that I used to know from back in the day. And him and I met about a year ago. I think it's been a year now, um, a year since we've known each other. And he actually, uh, through his influence, although he may not take credit for it, helped me get a, a job in teaching within, <laughs> within the same company, which is really cool. So him and I are both teachers, as I mentioned. And so we have that in in common. And then you what you heard in the beginning there was a little bit of Arabic and Portuguese, which he's he's interested in as as well as um, Amharic. He's he's one of my um, Amharic students. So um, let let's jump into let's jump into languages first, and then maybe we'll talk about some of the trips you've got. Delton, tell us a little bit about how you grew up, what language you grew up speaking, and how you can possibly be interested in uh, Arabic, Portuguese, and Amharic. <laughs> Good question, man. Thanks for having me on here. Um, and it's interesting. So I, I, I actually, I'm from the South. I'm from, uh, you know, Jackson, Tennessee. And um, yeah, I didn't grow up around many, I guess, cultures per se in regards to like different influence of languages and things. And so it wasn't until I would say college, um, I got exposed to... Um, you know, just a few different influences because the school I went to in college, it still is a small town in West Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I, I think it was a my, liberal arts college or a state school. No, it was a university. It was a state. Yeah. Yeah. University mm -hmm. of Tennessee at Martin. Yeah. 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 And so, yeah, I, I believe what, 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 what the thing that rung in my head or made a spark is when, um, I was looking online kind of when internet was kind of coming out, which is kind of going to dig myself age wise. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I looked up this um, Cuban conguero and I knew his name. So I, I typed it in and his, and his picture was, you know, he was, he was like a dark guy and it completely threw me off. And really? so you did, it did because before then I thought anyone with the Spanish name is from Mexico. Mm -hmm. That you know, sense. it's like you don't realize yeah. you could pass for Cuban. Yeah, I didn't know that. <laughs> so it's like, you know, anyone that has a Spanish last name, they're from Mexico. So uh, in fact, it, it just intrigued me. And so, um, yeah, I, I think that kind of sparked a little interest. And then fast forward, I moved out here to California for grad school. I went overseas and um, went to Brazil. And so, and there it's like, beleza, beleza, muito bom, muito legal, <laughs> muito saudade Brasil. And so, yeah, I just got exposed to just like all of my biases that I had in my head. Basically, I was just met just right head to head with it. It was like everything that I thought I knew was like in my face and it was not, you know, so I had the option to either just deny what's in front of me or mm -hmm. embrace it. And I, and to this day, I thank God that I embraced it. And so, yeah, I, I, I started trying to learn Portuguese and then I, you how, know, how long were you out there? I, you know, I was only in Brazil for about three semanas, like about three weeks. Yeah. And, and muito saudade, I miss it very much and, and had a really big influence on me. Um, I was in Salvador do Bahia and uh, Rio de Janeiro. I was in Salvador do Bahia uh, quite longer, I think like two weeks, like two of the two of those weeks. And um, yeah, it's just like being there, 
it has a heavy African influence because a lot of the Africans were actually ported, you know, um, into Salvador de Bahia at uh, near the Pelerino, which literally translates to pillory, which is a whipping post. Wow. And so, yeah. And so, um, yeah, it's just a, it has a heavy African influence there. And I've heard more more than the United States. Um, yes. I don't know if it's correct, but I've heard largest black diaspora outside of Africa. Yep, that is true. That's very true. Yeah. So, so yeah, I just got interested in the language. I knew I took Spanish in high school. And uh, surprisingly enough, I actually took German. I took Deutsch in wow. eighth grade. I mean, seventh eighth grade, yeah, because when they consolidate, yeah. So I took I took German in eighth grade and um, had a really great teacher, and so um, yeah. Just after going that, I realized that the I, I I'm fine with saying this the ignorance that I had, mm -hmm. and so I made a like a life goal to just like explore and learn as much as I can about other cultures, languages. Um, as you said, I started learning Arabic. Uh, I studied North Indian music and I tried to uh, mistakenly learn um, Hindi on my own. It, it did not work whatsoever. It didn't work? Okay. It didn't work. I watched, <laughs> but you know what? It's, it's funny. I watched a bunch of Bollywood movies. So I was like, I would practice my tabla, da, din, din, da, da, da. And as I'm watching Bollywood movies, but come to find out that not all the movies are in Hindi. They're in like different. Mm -hmm you know, dialects, um, different languages. And, uh, you know, it's like, it's not necessarily they're speaking in Hindi. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, yeah. So, well, that's interesting that they're, that they're that diverse in that way. So that's good too, because I, I could be wrong, but you know, most of the TV I've seen coming out of Ethiopia, which claims to have 87 languages is really just Amharic. We've ha had, I think since 1991, like news reporting, in mm. all the kind of various languages. So I've seen a bunch of that and and we have music certainly in all the, the languages and that's where people hear. I had a cousin just tell me she got introduced to Hadia music for the first time. You know, that's one of the, mm. the Southern peoples of Ethiopia. And, um, but you know, I've never seen like a Hadia movie <laughs> or a TV show. So it's, uh, it's interesting that it, Bollywood does give voice to the, the kind of smaller, communities within India. I, I really like the the Portuguese. Of course, my Brazilian jiu-jitsu or Gracie jiu-jitsu professors oh, yeah. are Brazilian. And so I, I hear Portuguese from them and, and from the various Brazilians that I do jiu-jitsu with. One of my favorite writers, Glenn Greenwald, since maybe mid the mid 2000s i've been a fan of his he lived in in portugal in 2001 and, and did a huge study on the drug policy there in portugal yeah, and then he's been living in exile in brazil since oh, he helped um, break the snowden story um oh, because really? he's, been, yeah, he's been persona non grata uh, to the u.s government um, he's like Julian Assange and Edward Snowden in that way. So, so Brazil is is on my heart. So I I loved that you got into the Portuguese and you told us about the Hindi. How did you get into Arabic, which is a Semitic language, and and thus um, I don't know Arabic, but I know a few words. You know, I know Salam alaikum. I said marhaba and whatever cognates. One time, a Kuwaiti friend, a Jordanian friend, a Moroccan friend, and me. Um, and I did this sometimes with my Saudi friends and in school, we sat down and, and had uh, 40 words that were the same in Arabic and in Amharic or Giz. So we have a bunch of words that are the same, yes. um, but I do not know that language and especially not the, the grammar. So how did you get into Arabic? Wow. Um, so it's just interesting. Um, I was actually um, at my uncle's place and it literally just popped in my head. I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to type in Arab Christians. And mm -hmm. so I just typed in Arab Christians on the internet. And then I um, found this uh, um, site. It's called ArabicBible.com. And so it was just talking about how um, that, you know, Arab Christians are, are, are you know, it's just, it's just a stigma that if you speak Arabic that you're Muslim. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that just fascinated me. Once again, coming from a background where I wasn't exposed to any things and I had these different biases. So, however, you know, I'm reading this 
And uh, I was just like, you know what? I want to learn Arabic. <laughs> and so <laughs> I just did as much as I could, you know, research. And um, and then, you know, I actually went to the library, you know, uh, book bookstores is one of my favorite places to go. And um, so I went to the library, went to the language section, and they had some the Pimsleur um, Arabic CDs. So I basically... Oh, you got them from the library for free? From the library for free. Amazing. Best place to learn. I mean, like, I mean, yeah, much props to the, you know, public library. Shout out to all the public libraries out there. I grew up uh, in public libraries, man. Every yes. day in high school for three years, I went to the public library. Right on. <laughs> that, that's, that's great. Yeah. So I, I got those uh, CDs, you know, and I got them on my MP3. And I just literally ride to work, just listening to it, you know, Isaiah, you know, I put the Kilimata be Mishkoyasawi, you know, just it starts you off just like very, just very basic and it just keeps building. Using and, phrases. Yep, using phrases. And I got up to like less than like 20 or something like that. I mean, I, it, and because it, it was just fun and the way mm -hmm. it, it, it had how you learned it, um, it was just really great. And so, I actually then found that there's a um, Arab speaking church, Christian church that's here in Long Beach. And so I, actually, I, I went there and I would like have one headphone on to listen to the translation and then also, you know, listen to the pastor. And um, oh, they had live translation. That's amazing. Yeah, they had live translation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. they wow. Had live translation. Wow. So, we could learn from that. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. And then, you know, I, I, I started, you know, get introduced to their community and, you know, the pastor and the son and things like that, um, which was really great. They were totally welcoming and everything. And uh, so that just encouraged me more. And um, uh, I was actually slated to go to. Um, Egypt, mm -hmm. uh, and it was, was oh, oh, that's a good point. So when we say Arabic, a misconception that a lot of people have is that there's sort of one Arabic all around oh, the place. Yes, good. From oh what I understand, there yeah. is a um, there is like a more ancient or classical literary Arabic. Mm -hmm. Then there's a kind of modernized version of that, the Fusha which most people would be familiar with and, you know, newscasters and maybe people preaching speak in, but then every different country has its own dialect, some of which are relatively intelligible, some not. Were you learning the, the Fusha, the modern standard Arabic or the, the Egyptian dialect and what sort of differences, you know, did that lead to? I love you. Oh my gosh. You're so great. I love your question. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. So I actually started learning the uh, Egyptian Arabic. So mm -hmm. the thing is, so I didn't even know that I just like I just saw Egyptian Arabic. I was like, oh, OK. But I didn't know that there were different dialects until later on when I start studying. Mm -hmm. And uh, and just as you said, and it's like because when I started speaking, um, they could automatically tell, oh, that's Egyptian, you know, because Isaiah Isaiah is, is straight Egyptian. You know, what does Isaiah mean? Isaiah is like, like, how are you or like? It's mm -hmm. like, a, it's like, hello. And, and so, yeah. um, you know, that's what it, I was just repeating whatever the thing was saying on the recording. But the other interesting thing is, is that I had the Pimsleur series and then I had a behind the wheel Arabic, which come to find out that was the um, spoken Arabic, which is the modern standard. So, oh, <laughs> yeah. So, and, you know, once again, you know, to my ignorance, I just thought like, it's Arabic, you know? Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, when I would, I would greet and I would say, speak um, the phrases that I know from the um, lessons, they're like, oh, Egyptian. But then I say, I think like, for society, like it's a um, pleasure to meet you. I was like, oh, that's modern standard. So I would start mixing, you know, the mixing the two, just as I did when I was in Brazil. I knew maybe like, a few grains of sand of uh, Spanish and uh -huh. even less of Portuguese. Yeah. And so when I was down there, I would speak my like broken Spanish yeah. and like just jacked up Portuguese <laughs> and mixed in with some English, mm -hmm. you know, to try to convey, you know, 
But I, I could hear a lot of Portuguese because I speak Spanish pretty well. I'm not yeah. really fluent, but I've done, you know, professional things in Spanish. I've solved mediation cases. I've done parent teacher meetings in, mm. in Spanish before. So I'm competent enough where when I hear the Portuguese, I could understand a lot of it. I have to kind of adjust my ears. And I'm used to doing that between Amharic and Tigrinya as well. Wow. So I have a little practice of uh, some people, if they're only l used to their dialect or their version of a language, they don't, even within Amharic, there are different ways of pronouncing things. People use totally different letters. And so yeah. I'm, I'm accustomed to that in Amharic where I've seen other people not accustomed to that or who don't make that, that effort. Even actually you'll crack up as great as I am in English. I was in Springfield, uh, Missouri at a debate camp. Yep. Missouri, <laughs> um, at a Drury university. And I was, I was eating at a down home barbecue joint and it was, uh, a local a black American woman behind the counter. And as I approached her, she said, how are you? Are you? And, uh, I blinked at her and I was embarrassed because I've always taken my pride, no matter what anyone says, I don't care where they are, as long as it's English, I've understood them, I've made an effort. Whereas some people, you know, like poke fun when they hear a new way of saying something. Yeah, I was yeah, so yeah. embarrassed, I walked out of the line. And I, I tried my absolute hardest. I spent about five to 10 minutes, literally just standing there and watching different people engage with her. And after 10 minutes, my brain shows you the plasticity of the brain, it, it adapted. And yeah. I heard her saying, hey, how are you? Yeah. Yeah. How may I help you? Yeah. But the way she said it was like all at once and super fast. I imagine because she just says it to everybody every day in addition to the draw. So she said like, hey, how are you? How may I help you? And I was able to, to get it done. <laughs> um, but that's just to say I've practiced kind of listening. But sometimes I get in trouble with my, my Brazilian friends because I'll use a Spanish word. And they have so many people who like know Spanish but don't know Portuguese in LA that some of them get pissed off about it that I, I could tell. Um, but yeah, if I could skate by with my Spanish, I'd be good. But I've heard a lot of people in Brazil speak Spanish. Did anyone try speaking to you in Spanish thinking you were like Honduran or Nicaraguan or something? You know, actually, they thought I was Brazilian. So, oh, nice. Yeah. So, only thing I knew how to say in Portuguese was falo português um pouco. Okay, that's you speak a little Portuguese. See, I understood that. Yeah, I understood that. Uh, I couldn't say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And say, and so the thing is, at first I was saying, hablo Portuguese <laughs> <laughs> un poquito. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> it was so bad. But then, you know, I started learning, okay, falo portugues un poco. And, and, um, so the thing is, like, oh, como vai, tudo bem, como vai, and I'm just like, un poco. And the more I said a little, <laughs> The more they kept speaking. You got mice, mice, <laughs> mice, Portuguese. Mice, Portuguese, you know, so it's like, uh, you know, so yeah, yeah. It's just interesting with, you know, in regards to what you mentioned, like, yeah, when I was there, they actually thought I was Brazilian. Mm -hmm. um, and so. And you had a similar experience when you said that you went to Ethiopia. You said, hey, is yeah. that my uncle over there? Yes, exactly. You know, I, I highly... I highly like encourage like just to travel because it just opens up your perspective. I know for me, just open up my perspectives in a whole nother way, you know? So even like, yes, when I was in Ethiopia, I am like, I literally, this guy, we were walking, you know, I saw this car. I'm like, you know how just like automatically your brain and it's like you, I was like, oh my gosh, this guy looks like my uncle, you know? <laughs> and <it's> so... <laughs> And, and, and so, uh, in, in the same, it, it was the same in, um, Brazil as well. It's just, um, and were you walking yeah. around in a Natala in Ethiopia? No, you know what? I'm, a, I'm Cause my, I saw I'm, some pictures of you in a Natala, but I didn't know if you were walking around like that. You know what? You know what? I tried, I, I got the Natala. Let me see. Before if you I, had that cross on top yeah. of a Natala, <laughs> you will fool everybody. You know, I, but I don't know because the way I, I, it I, I could not learn know how to you know put it on correctly mm. for the life yeah. of me. So I yeah. probably had that thing wrapped around my neck. I, I you know they would know you're American. Yeah. But they would probably they would call you diaspora. That's how yeah. they say diaspora. Yes, yes. you are you're diaspora. 
Did you did you hear that phrase at all when you were out I there? I hear that phrase a lot. <laughs> you know what? Actually, it's interesting you mentioned because, um, yeah, so it's like they would automatically speak Amarinya to me. And so, like, what you know, I'm walking around. Once again, only thing I know how to say is salam. Or I'm Salam, gonna... that's good. And you're cheating. You're using your Arabic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so you know, I'm walking and, you know, and I'm just natural, you know, you, you know, make eye contact with someone just to speak. And I always salam. And I would hear, you know, them say something. And it's natural for me to like, you know, I hear something. I'm going to like turn my head. But I don't know if they're saying something to me because I don't understand. But the thing is, they probably think I'm responding to them and I hurt them, but I can't respond. So all I can say is like salam and just keep walking. And so one guy, he was like, yeah, I thought you was kind of like a, you know, like a, up, you know, snooty like diaspora or something. Cause you didn't respond, but no, you're actually from America. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, buddy, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, I, I'm, you know, let's check the DNA. Cause you know, I'm, I'm sure I got some roots, some level of root here. <laughs> You know, but yeah, yeah, to that point, yeah, it's, um, yeah, I had a lot of people speaking to me in Amarinya, but, you know, that, and that's why I heard that word a lot, you know, in regards mm -hmm. to, yeah. When, yeah. when did, uh, let's rewind a bit, when did Ethiopia get on your map? Because you're talking about, for example, um, this idea that, you know, there are dark skinned Cubans or Afro heritage Cubans was a surprise to you. And Ethiopia has kind of been in the imagination of the black community in various points, I would say, but especially throughout the 20th century, um, even now in the 21st century, you know, with uh, Kendrick Lamar trying to tie the N word to the word Negus, um, oh, yeah. which is king, <laughs> the false etymology there. But uh, <laughs> interesting that he makes that connection uh, in that grand black Israelite Hotep tradition. But um what was it that first put Ethiopia kind of on the map? Like, did you always know that there was this country called Ethiopia or how did you kind of know about it? And then what kind of prompted that, that visit besides the obvious, like uh, this idea of yours where you share with Mark Twain, actually, that your prejudices get taken away by travel and exploration. Hmm. Uh, you know, that's really great. So, you know, as far as Ethiopia, you know, I had to backtrack to growing up. And um, once again, I'm, I'm fine with, you know, sharing my, uh, my, I would say ignorance or bias or something, however we put it. Um, you know, the negative, the connotation I had about Ethiopia growing up was a negative one. Mm -hmm. And it the was- famine. Did you yes. know about the famine in the 80s the famine, and the yes. Sally Struthers commercials in the 90s? Yes, exactly. I saw, you know, you know, the, the images on TV and, you know, the food drives and things like that. And so it's just, you know, talk about TV as far as programming brains. I mean, that's like a it could be like a whole subset conversation. But um, yeah, so that was my I that was just my idea. So it wasn't even something it's just out there. And when I moved out here, I think when, once again, right there in my face, I was working, um, I was actually working at a, a uh, at a phone company mm -hmm. and this couple came in and the couple was very beautiful. It was a very beautiful couple that came in. And I'm just, I still have my, my countryness in me. I was like, where y'all from? You know, just like, <laughs> who, like and, you know, it's like back home, we say, who your peoples, you know? Yeah. like, so we could just make a connection. So I asked him like, what are you, where are y'all from? And the guy said, he's, you know, they're from Ethiopia and, you know, he was with this girl and, and I'm just like, and the first thing that came in my mind was, um, I think I shared with you, with you in the, in the past is, oh, wow, the food must have worked or something. It's like, that was the first thing to pop in my mind, mm -hmm. but ever so glad that didn't come out of my mouth. But then I started thinking. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been awkward. Yeah. 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 You know? So then I started thinking like, wait a minute then reflecting back to my experience in brazil what was my image of brazil before i went but when i got there it was completely shattered so that kind of like uh i would say just planted like a small seed and it wasn't until our mutual friends um came from texas and were my roommates they were um youth leaders at a, at a ethiopian church in la and 
through them was like my introduction into the Ethiopian community. And I was just like, wow, I never, you know, never thought this, you know, and it it was just so beautiful. And And so what surprised me about that, I've said this to you before, it's just fascinating is the Egyptian Christians that you found were Egyptian Protestant Christians. The Ethiopian Christians you found (laughs) were Ethiopian Protestant Christians. And those are actually the minority group of Christians within the minority of Christians in Egypt and within the majority of Christians in Ethiopia. Egypt Mm -hmm. and Ethiopia, the Coptic church and the Gutes church, they were our popes from the year 300 till the 1948, I believe. So for some 1600 years, the Egyptian Coptic Christians and the Ethiopian Tawahado Christians had a deep connection. And even today we still have a deep connection, but especially for, for 1600 years, what's so fascinating to me is like, there's a connection even between the peoples you met, but you also were interacting with a, an interesting uh, uh, subgroup within that. Did, did they ever mention when you were with the Egyptian Christians, did they ever mention the Coptic Christians and with the uh, Ethiopian Protestants, did they ever mention the kind of Ethiopian Orthodox or was that in the conversation at all in any of the time you spent with any of those groups? You know, that's, I, I love that question. So I learned about the, um, the Coptic, um, the Coptics in Egypt actually through just my own research. Mm-hmm. And so, um, in fact, when I was working at a, uh, I was working at a bank at the time in the midst of me learning Arabic and a family would come in and I would kind of get used to like looking at the last name and <laughs> <laughs> nice. so I would look at the last name that, and, and, uh, I would guess. And so versus asking them, um, Hey, are you, or, or something like that? I would say some far it, Oh, you know, the, the last name would be like, um, like, uh, Mansour or stuff like that. Or Muhammad, I would say, is this French? Is your last name? Is it, is it, are you from <laughs> I just to say something completely far off, yeah. you know, intentionally. And then when they tell me, then I speak my little Arabic. And so, um, that's when I learned there's a, a Coptic church that's in Torrance actually. Oh yeah. 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 So there's, uh, you know, a lot of the family, um, people, people from that church would come to the bank and, um, yeah. And so that's when I started doing my own research in regards to like the Coptic church and, Saint uh, Mercurius and St. Abram. Uh, I wanted to make sure I got the name right. I, I didn't know the St. Abram part. I knew the St. Mercurius, uh, mm-hmm. a friend of mine, uh, Peter, actually, he's, uh, that's his church. I oh, passed really? by there. Yeah. I passed by there. Wow. You know what, when this is over with, I would love to go over there and see like, if some of the family mem- families that get, yeah, because I mean, like there's this, there was this like little kid, you know, uh, he would like speak Arabic to me and things like that. It was, it was really cool. Really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's when I learned, I learned about the Coptic church through my own research mm-hmm. yeah, and, and about Alexandria, Egypt. And uh, I learned some of the traditions of the Copts and, you know, where the word Copt derived from. And that's where the actually were, I'm sorry whether we're Egypt derives from the word Copt to my understanding. And um, yeah. And that dialect that you mentioned, the Egyptian dialect, one of the things I've learned from my Coptic friends is that one of the things that makes it um, well, one of the reasons why it's good that you chose it is because they're so dominant in the, they're basically the Hollywood of the middle East yes, and Africa. Yes. And so, so a lot of people know the Egyptian dialect because of their music and film. But then one of the reasons why it is different than those other dialects is the Coptic language, which is uh, another, you know, it's an African language, part of the Afro-Asiatic group. I think it's in its own category with the Egyptian languages, but it's part of the larger Afro-Asiatic family, which includes Cushitic languages and, and Semitic languages. But they have a lot of Coptic words in Arabic. I don't know if Yitzhak is a Coptic word, but I read an article one time that listed a bunch of words that are straight up loan words from Coptic to Egyptian oh, Arabic. Really? So without knowing it, I'm sure you've picked up some Coptic words. Interesting. Yeah, I'd love to actually check that out because, um, but yeah, yeah, I, as you were saying, it's like that uh, that 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 tie-in, um, but because I think it's like a mixture was a mixture of like, um, 
I mean, they they claim to be like the, to my understanding, the true Egyptians, but that's like probably a, a whole, even once again another yeah, story. Yeah, they're, they're, they're they are the descendants of uh, Pharaoh. Yes, and mm -hmm. so they their language is the modern like all language changes, but it is the the modern equivalent of what the language that was written in the hieroglyphics. Yes. But because they've been subjugated by so many groups, especially when they were subjugated by Greek speakers, they basically adopted the Greek alphabet. So if you see their alphabet, you're like, oh, that looks like Greek. Well, it is Greek. They just modified, you know, a few things so that it could represent their language with certain, you know, vowels and vocalization. Um, but yeah, pretty much they, they have the same language and they even use the same melodies. So for example, um, Golgotha is a hymn that they use on Good Friday, and they sing this about Jesus's burial. But the actual <laughs> melody, the musical melody, is the melody that was used to bury the pharaohs. Mm. And so they flipped it on its head. <laughs> Can you imagine uh, the God of Israel being glorified with the melodies of Pharaoh? <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a there's a nice like beauty to it. I've been to their midnight praises before. And really? they, um, yeah, they have two hour service on Saturday evenings to prepare for Sunday mornings. And during that, that evening service, it's either called Vespers or Midnight Praises. They sing, you know, glory to the God of Israel who buried Pharaoh and all of his chariots. Hmm. And to me, it's like, that's so powerful and self-scathing. What community do you know that would fully submit to God? to the point where they're glorifying their own old king being buried in the Red wow. Sea with all of his chariots, all of his armies. And that's one that's part of their their hymnography on Saturday evenings. Hmm. I have to check that out. Wow. Wow. Yeah, it, it's like I, I it, it this is um, you know, part of that that kindred spirit that you and I share in regards to like language and history and um with that um but oh yeah, you, you mentioned about the um, like the movies and things like that yep. in the Egyptian dialect. Yes, yeah, that is true. In fact, um, what I was told because I was a part of this um, Arabic meetup group, like in LA, which was mm -hmm. pretty cool. It was just pretty cool. We just um, meet and we just speak in Arabic, and the uh, the host person would challenge us, the ones that knew mostly of you know this type, you know dialect you challenge them you know with another and so uh but yeah so to my understanding everyone understands the egyptian dialect because of the media and the movies and things however um there's certain dialects that you know if they speak their own personal that own dialect they may not be able to understand each other mm -hmm. um so then I, they would go to like the, the to the spoken arabic nice yeah. Nice. And, and so going back to, to Ethiopia, how much Amharic did you know? You said you, you know, the word Salam. Uh, I think we went through a few rows of the, the alphabet together before you went. Yeah. Am, I, am, am I right? Yes, or, that is correct. You yeah. know, um, did you practice any alphabet out there just I in trying did. to read signs and stuff? I did. You know, I, I think, um, what it, it, what it was is that, you know, the way I learned um, Arabic was, you know, it started off like, excuse me, you know, la and then mm -hmm. it just builds from there. Yes. And so by, you know, the first lesson, you know, at least have a say some type of conversation. And yes. it's the same thing for Thai and all the other languages and things like that. Um, so for Maninya, I, I, I was like, okay, cool. Once again, I was looking for that type of system. Mm -hmm. So when Beginning I end with conversational phrases, yeah, just conversational. I went to your class <clears throat> that Saturday. No, no, we, yeah, we met up and then um, start practicing the rows. I'm like, cool, and like, okay, well, let me just find some stuff to learn some phrases. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. I didn't have a frame of reference. I didn't have a frame of reference. So when I got there, I was just kind of like, I didn't know how to say. I can, I can only speak a little, um, you know, I'm hard. I couldn't mm -hmm. even say that, you know, it's tinnish, like, tinnish. if you just said tinnish, tinnish. Okay. You, you know there. what? That, I, I should have written that down. Cause yeah. even in Thailand, I went to Thailand. I know how to say, you know, nitnoi, you know, nitnoi krap, you know, just, that's like, that's like, 
So yeah. um, even in, you know, Brazil, all the other languages, even Farsi, I know how to at least say, I don't know much. Oh, yeah. that's right. I forgot you speak Farsi too. Yeah, I know. I know a few. I know a little bit of Farsi. Yeah. Uh, but, no uh, bazorge. <laughs> uh, oh my gosh. Uh, Farsi yakemi balanistam. And it's like, I don't speak Farsi. That I probably even said there. It's been a while since I practiced my Farsi. Yeah, my uh, best friend is, is Persian. I was best man at his wedding. And so over the years, I've uh, picked up a lot of formal greetings and cuss words. <laughs> <laughs> way to go the way to go to learn the languages yeah that's the first thing everyone wants to teach you exactly exactly i had friends in high school that was like the only thing they wanted to teach me i'm glad I, i've learned the formal phrase i actually one time solved a mediation i was in court with my uh, mediation professor yes and yes. um there was a litigated case involving uh, an older persian man and at one point he had his arms crossed he had a, a droopy face and he was mad and it just didn't seem like we're getting anywhere. And I knew he was Persian, just like you, you know, I look at names and I look at faces and I'm usually able to guess. Actually, it's funny because I go into banks and a lot of the banks around me have Persians or Armenians. And if it's a Persian or Armenian, I always have something to say to them. If it's the Armenian, I talk about our church, which is the same. If it's a Persian, I'll actually speak to them in some Farsi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but this guy, I saw him and I said, um, why are you tarofing? He's like, what? And I was like, Shoma Choteri? And, and we started talking a little. <laughs> and he was so shocked that, you know, from his point of view, this black, random black guy, mm -hmm. after like having, you know, 20, 30 minutes of dialogue in just English, would bring up this concept. So the Tarof concept is virtually identical to Ethiopian culture, something we call Magdardar. And it's this idea of, um, for the sake of pride, you don't say that you actually want to do something. It usually has to do with food. You usually say no to food because you don't want to look like you're hungry and can't afford food. But that concept goes to, to everything like being polite and nice. Like there's a funny video of Tarof online of four Persians at a stop sign to each telling <laughs> each to go ahead of them if you've seen it. And they spend like five minutes there. Um, you know, I've spent the same thing in the, in the Midwest when I was in North Dakota, I would say the North Dakotan culture is like that. Like probably a lot of old cultures have this idea of like being polite, you know, and, and yeah, yeah, know. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I solved that mediation. He changed his mind because I said that. And I remember my professor, she was so delighted. She was like, honestly, there's nothing more I can teach you. You, you know, I couldn't have said that word to him and he wouldn't have reacted. Yeah. So yeah, that, yeah. that cultural piece, like the fact that you make that effort to speak these people's languages, Thai, Farsi, Arabic, Portuguese, Amharic, you're going to affect somebody. You know, I think people, people treat you differently when you make that effort to know a little bit about, you know, their culture. Yeah, I, 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 I totally agree. Um, and, and I actually, um, you know, share with like my family and friends and stuff. It's like, um, I believe when you learn, like take, like I said, take the time just to learn someone's language or, you know, that effort, you know, I, I believe it like opens up doors that you never knew existed because you just didn't even, you know, just didn't know like a phrase or something like that, you know, and it's interesting because um, uh, when I went home and, um, and someone had a kiosk at, at, at the mall and my sister was like, yeah, you know, they're, I think they're from uh, like Egypt or something. Like, oh, really? Once again, I'm like, Oh, you know, how your name? What's your name? They told me their name. And I'm like, oh, is, is that French? Oh, no. You know, <laughs> I know it's bad. However, you know, it's like. No, it's a good it's, technique. It's a good you know, technique. You know, it's just like. You hit me with the, I think you said East African. So it was at least closer to home. You know what? <laughs> uh, I'm exposed. Yeah, I'm exposed. Yes. Yes. Because, and, and the reason why I do that, because um, I've learned that, you know, you know, you know, stigma is, it's a real thing, you know, mm -hmm. and it's a negative connotation or a negative stigma about a particular people group and um, how you looked upon and things like that. There may be this like, you know, kind of like, okay, well, who are you friend or foe? Like, who are you, you know, what's I, your I'll tell you what it is. You know, it's a, it's a xenophobia thing 
um, where I experienced it in college, you know, for the first time in my life, I didn't know anybody conservative until I went to college. So my first interaction with the conservative people, you know, I grew up in a very liberal progressive area in Los Angeles. So my first interaction with conservative people was at Pepperdine in undergrad, but at the same time, that's the most liberal conservative school you've ever been to uh, mm -hmm. because of the location, you know, it's yeah, in Los right Angeles. There. Right there in like Malibu, right? It's yeah, like it is. <laughs> but it draws people from Arkansas and Texas and all over the place. And so, Interesting. Uh, and not just the cities, like the rural areas too. So, you know, uh, there's a whole like uh, black hashtag going on this year about wild things that have been said by Pepperdine professors and students. Even now, they're trying to get rid of one of the deans because he he disagrees with the New York Times uh, 1619 project. And you know what? To an extent, I do too. So I'm, I'm not fully on the uh, bandwagon of firing this guy. I don't know what his full views are. But uh, to your point, some people, when they ask the question, where are you from? It's to distinguish you from them. And they don't really care to learn about where you're from. They're just asking it to make you feel different. And that's where this whole culture uh, in academia of uh, the language of what they call microaggressions are. Mm. And, and, and when not millions, but let's say tens or scores of people ask you that same question in that same manner with that same neglect and carelessness, it could build up on your psyche. The way they describe it is they say a microaggression is like a paper cut and one paper cut ain't no thing, but a hundred paper cuts, that's going to hurt. Yeah. The difference I would say between a lot of those people and you is you, you're actually curious. You actually want to learn. And I think that needs to be uh, distinguished where a lot of people don't make those things distinct. So I would mess with people because I know there's this ethos where everybody believes they're Christian. As soon as somebody hears my name, Henok, almost every time without fail, they would say, where are you from? And so if I thought they were a conservative Christian who would have some Christian guilt and they didn't really care to know, I would just say it's from the Bible. And they were like, oh, oh, okay. And they don't want to admit that they don't know, you know, what Henoch is in the Bible. Now, some of them, they would say <laughs> where in the Bible. And I would say, oh, it's a translation of Enoch. And then they would know Enoch. But the ones who don't ask, I could tell they were run out really curious and they would pretend like they know what I'm talking about and they would walk away. And I'm like, okay, that's it. That's where we're going <laughs> to leave it. So you get them, you get them, you poke them back. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. I, I don't start stuff, but I end stuff. Yeah. So yeah, I, actually, you know, you, 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 you caught me and I, and I, I, I revealed myself. So yeah, when I first, um, you know, when I first met you at the, at the school, when we were at the school, I was like, you know, Hey, how are you doing? You know, what's your name? You said, hey, no. And then, uh, I was like, um, cause I was like, this guy's Abisha, you know, but yeah. I didn't want to, once again, it's like, I didn't want to be like, Hey, are you, you know? So that's why I didn't want to like, get it wrong. If I was like Somali or Kenyan or something. Exactly. Or exactly. Exactly. Cause it's like, I don't want to, once again, just, yeah, just don't want to offend. However, so but mm -hmm. I am curious. Some Ethiopians don't even like the word Habesha. There's all sort of internal dialogue and politics around that word too. Wow. I wow. Okay. Thanks for making note of that one. All right. <laughs> uh, so yeah, when you told me your name, I believe I said I was like, um, "Is that East African?" Yeah, I think I said, "Is that East African?" He was like, "Well, it is." I'm like, "All right, cool." And then I was like, um, "Where?" And then you said Ethiopia, and then you know, then I was like, "All right." Wow, there was a connection. In fact, when we met um, at the school, that Sunday is when I actually purchased my ticket to go to Ethiopia. No way. Look at that timing. Look at God. Uh, exactly. I feel like God is the divine weaver. I give all praises to God in, in, in regards to that because, um, and, and the thing is, I was very hesitant to go because Whenever I go to a country, at least I at least know someone there. Like when mm -hmm. I went to the Philippines, I had my um, host mentor that I went to. Um, when I went to Thailand, I have my family that I went to. You know, and so this particular situation, you know, I didn't have like a set people that I knew that's there. Um, but yeah, and so I I kind of like um, you know 
In fact, a few days before that, I called pretty much almost every Ethiopian that I knew, like my old roommate. <laughs> I was like, hey, how you doing? I haven't talked to you in about a year or so, but uh, I'm going to Ethiopia. And yeah, how you doing? You know, because, <laughs> you know, it's just Hello. like, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, it's just that, that, that unknown, you know, that unknownness. And so, um, yeah, yeah, that Sunday, booked the flight, and then we met on Wednesday. And then the connection was made ever since. Um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it, in regards to like uh, um, approaches, I think what was the, I think the initial thing you're mentioning about. Um, about the, the kind of otherization, people would refer to yeah. it as a microaggression and otherization, xenophobia, trying mm -hmm. to make somebody feel like a, a stranger without an actual curiosity, you know, like a, like a question that's kind of just a shot in the dark. Yeah. Uh, just like you different, not yeah. like, oh, you're different. What is that like? <laughs> exactly. And sometimes actually um, when I meet someone and I find out, you know, whatever country they're from, once that is past that, you know, that uncomfortable, you know, thing, I, I started asking like, hey, how do you say, how are you in your language? That's the first thing. I'm like, what language do, you, do they speak there? And then uh, when I found out the language, um, I'm, I started thinking, Hmm, I wonder what's the root language. And so I started asking them, like, do you know what the root language is? And sometimes like, I don't know, you know? <laughs> so I actually, right there, you know, in front of them, look up, okay, cool, is this root language? You know, just show like, I'm more interested in not like, um, you as a, like a, I guess as, as a, I wanna say like as a character or something like that, like, oh, I met this whatever person, however, it's more of like, I'm genuinely interested in like the language, the culture, you know, what is your experience um, growing up? If you grew up there, growing up there, living here, or if you're from here, but your parents are from there, you know, what's that dynamic like, you know, in regards to, you know, is it like, a is it a conflict or, you know, things like that. But, um, but yeah, yeah, I, I, I believe um, it, it's, it's like important just to, just to be open and learn. Yeah. That's just beautiful. Be I, I saw the other day on the IG, you posted yourself <laughs> reading uh, some of the Amharic alphabet. That was beautiful. I gave you some feedback. You did, you yes. did really well. Yes, yes. Talk to us about the, the upset. As of now, you've learned a few words. I always give you some vocabulary, yes. uh, especially with vocabulary you begin with, but I don't do my serious deep conversational skills or deep vocabulary until I think somebody's familiar with the alphabet because there are a lot of uh, dangers in that with the the alphabet is so different there's so many different sounds if you change one sound it changes the meaning of the word or if you spell something differently it changes the meaning of the word so I like to really pound in uh, my students the the alphabet first and I know other people do things differently there's a state department book out there people could find on archive.org where yeah. they don't even teach the alphabet at all and they go straight into conversational words and they write it out in the Latin alphabet or the alphabet of, of English. What, what has been kind of easy? What's been kind of hard so far in your journey of, of uh, learning Amharic? You know, um, you actually, you, you hit it right there on the, on the, on the money. Um, I truly, after initially taking um, that lesson from you before I went, being there here in the language and now you know post ethiopia um i truly see why it's important to learn the alphabet because um because that was the issue i didn't have a frame of reference it's like i'm hearing all these uh, in in this in it's like you know I, you know it's like um yeah, like like what when I when I went to that you know when I went to that church uh, that my roommates you know were leaders at, I was slicing and dicing everybody's name. Like I mean, everyone that introduced it, I'm just like, I thought I know how to talk. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just sitting there. I'm I'm one of those people. I'm like looking at your mouth. Like how do you how do you even do that? Yeah. So with that being said, yeah, I. I truly, truly understand why it's important to learn the alphabet. And so, in fact, that's why I, I posted that video because um, for me, it, it forces myself to get outside my comfort zone 
Mm -hmm. And I also see why it's important to speak it out loud as well. Yes. Um, yes. I think you're mentioning, please correct me if I'm um, like about the guys language is spoken is to be spoken. It's like, um, yeah, the, the reading, the word for reading, this is the same actually in Hebrew, although the words are different. The word to read is also the word to read out loud is also the word to speak. Yes. It's all the same word. Mm -hmm. um, because there's no such thing as selfish reading. Like the predominant reading is uh, done by the elites because, you know, up until the communists in the 80s and the 70s, 80% of Ethiopia was illiterate. And so you would read in community. You know, people would gather around, you know, whether it be a fire or whether it just be a circle anywhere, you would sit in a circle and you would have somebody read out loud in public or you'd be in church and you'd hear the biblical readings. And yeah. people will read out loud and then a lot of people would just hear. In yeah. fact, there are a lot of blind sages. I was just talking with my good teacher today about how there are a lot of blind sages. Not everyone who's blind is a sage, but there is an inordinate amount of blind sages in the Ethiopian church. Some of them who lost their sight later in life, but some who are blind from birth. And the way they responded to that blindness is just different. They just totally absorbed the teachings of the church and, um, one of the leading scholars of the 20th century who birthed a number of great scholars. He's passed away now, but he birthed a lot of the great scholars who are in charge now. He was totally blind and he mastered all the categories of the church's uh, traditional schools of teaching, meaning like three different schools, music schools. There are like three different music schools that he mastered. He mastered the poetry school and he mastered the, the school of biblical interpretation. Wow. And he did that all blind. And so wow. that means like, you know, he had to have people reading to him. The singing, at least he could just sit there and sing, yeah, but yeah. there are actual musical notes. And that means he's never seen the musical notes. And he actually told me there was one miraculous occasion where he was able to, to write out, you know, the words and the, and the musical notes, having never seen them, you know, you know, whether someone believes that or not, it, it, it's just, it's crazy. Um, whether uh, he did that or not, yeah, he, yeah, knew, yeah. he knew all those melodies. And he wow. knew, like, to be a, a teacher in the school of biblical interpretation, for example, if you want to be a New Testament scholar in the Ethiopian church, you have to memorize the entire New Testament, and you have to be able to say the interpretation of each line. And so he did that in addition to all the music schools. Wow. It's like, what am I doing with my life? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing. Think about it. <laughs> Think about it. You have a nine to five. Okay. You have a nine to five. You have all these different interests. Homeboy doesn't have a nine to five. This is his nine to five. His nine to five is the church. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so that's 40 hours a week. Mm -hmm. And then think about, he's been doing it since he was 10 years old. Oh, wow. And, and then think about like, okay, what are his extracurricular activities? No, these are his extracurricular activities. And he doesn't watch TV. So no Netflix, no Hulu, no cinema. <laughs> no YouTube like, or anything, yeah, yeah. Full time. Like when they're in the church, they're fully in the church. That That is what they do. Wow. 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 There's something to be said. Wow. Yeah. But, uh, you've, uh, but you've made progress. So you said what the <laughs> difficulties were, but you've kept yourself honest. And yeah. you've, you've, been, you've been making – Progress. Have there been any connections yet between the Arabic that that you practiced before, or even the Farsi? Actually, there's yeah. some Arabic loan words in Farsi that my Persian friend and I sometimes talk about. Yeah, you know, there's some Arabic words, but I guess it's that you know, there's so many different sounds within the Ethiopian language. Is that um, you know, yeah, it, it, it's it's just different. So yeah, so in regards, you know, when when I made that video and I posted it. Um, yeah, it's basically, it's actually to keep myself honest, you know, it's that it, it forces me to say, okay, this is what I know. I'm going to record myself and I'm going to post it intentionally. Hopefully my teacher looks at it, you know, <laughs> y'all you know? see, y'all see this man, Delton is a, is a psychological genius. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, and I hope he comments and I hope, you know, it's like, Teacher, teacher, look what I'm doing. You know, so and <laughs> that's and, like candy for me. Somebody reading the the alphabet is like candy for me. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, and I just soak it up. It's like, yeah, you made your um, 
you know, tell me what to correct. And, and so, you know, I went back to my app and, you know, pressing on that um, again, you know, just to make sure I say it correctly. And, mm-hmm. and I'm going to post it again, you know, and um, it, it's just my way of like, I get it, you know, I'm, I'm going to learn this. I'm and so I, glad. I, I'll tell you that I, I've been fluent, you know, since I was a child, but my accent has changed a lot. And I have videos online from me speaking Amharic and Guz in 2014. And it makes me cry. Like it hurts mm. so bad yeah. because my pronunciation was way worse. My understanding was was still good, but my pronunciation was so worse and it's gotten better. Um, I fool most people. Some people think I'm just uh, someone who was e- in Ethiopia as a child and then moved away. They, they Nobody guesses that I was born in the U.S. and speak the level I do because that would put them to shame. Um, but uh, when I hear like how I used to pronounce things, it it hurts me. And so just the fact that you have, I don't know if it's a gene or if it's a learned behavior, but mm-hmm. this ability to just subject yourself constantly to new things. I know a lot of Ethiopians who have given up on the language learning and they've stagnated and a lot of them who've actually gotten worse because they get embarrassed, you know, because of whatever level they are at. But, you know, with Thai, Farsi, Arabic, Portuguese, and Amharic, <laughs> uh, I, I love, uh, honestly, the the courage and, you know, obviously it, ex- it excites me and I'm, I'm sure, you know, the more time that we spend on it, <laughs> you're going to shock a lot of people. And I, I told you, I'll, I'll make you better than most native speakers. If you keep going at it, uh, no question. <laughs> I, you know, I definitely appreciate that. And this is, it's, it's actually what I need. Um, and, and, and interesting thing when you mentioned in, um, <clears throat> about like uh, how you sound when you speak words and speak a language, it actually ties over to, you know, um, you know, just like my life. I feel like my life calling, my life passion is to, make the connection between music and language. Mm-hmm. You know? If you go to any country or any part, you listen to like the indigenous music and, and then you listen to, you know, the language, it's going to be like this, you know, um, when I, you know, just, it's just taking up a different conversation. But when I was in, like in Brazil, you know, uh, in Rio, they speak fast Portuguese. Fala, como vai? Legal, legal. It's like, and you listen to the samba, you go further up the coast to Salvador da Bahia. Ah, como vai? Tudo bem, capazinho hora. Ah, muito legal, na beleza. It's no problem. And and so the Portuguese is much like it's different, you know. And slow down. They slow down. And I can relate to that coming from the south, actually, <laughs> you know, because we have like a little draw. But, um, but you know, there they have this um, style of music it's called samba reggae, which is a mixture of Jamaican reggae and Brazilian samba. Samba, mm-hmm. and it's like, uh, como vai você? Get you to the bench, como vai você? And so it's like, it's this mixture. And, yeah, and- there's a famous song that sounds exactly like that. I can't, I don't know what it's called, but it just came in my head. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's like a, it's like a, it's like a kind of almost like a, a groove that's 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 down there. Um, or you go to India, it, it's like um, it's it's like in my ears, it's like a melody. It goes up and down like a melody. When I practice my tabla, da din din, da da din din, da ki da di kiri 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 na. So it's like I, when I play the tabla, it's it's like a din da di kiri kiri na, da da din din na, da da kiri kiri na, da kiri kiri da kiri kiri da da kiri 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 na, da da din na. So it's like. It's like I can hear, I can hear the language in the music. And mm-hmm. and it's like no matter where you go, and even here in the United States, you know, it's like um, you know, from the south, and you know, we we draw words out and things like that. And what are we known for? We know for a blues, we learn we know for country music. Um, and even, you know, there's like an East Coast style of hip hop versus West Coast. You yeah. know, so and, and Texas, and Texas so, and chopped. Yeah, so it's like, and now you know because come like a mixture and things like that. But mm-hmm. uh, there's something to be said about, for one, the environment that you're around, 
and hearing the speech patterns or if there's tones and things like that in the rhythmic figures of how we talk yeah um into how you as a creative you create you create something creating something from like the surrounding so it's like it's gonna it's like a constant flow so in the midst of learning amania it's like i have my um i forgot the name of that radio station app that i have Arif can, Zafan. yeah it's like um when i'm working out it's like i just have to listen to it and then i'm listening watching um and I'll go on YouTube and, and, and try and watch some movies in, you know, in Amania is mm -hmm. as much as I can just to hear what, and what I'm listening for is what's that rhythmic pattern? What's that flow? And I have to say, it's a, I'm able to pick it up a whole lot better. Of course, I still don't know what they're saying, but it's like, it doesn't sound like just a gob of conglomeration of just, I don't know this as I felt when I was there. I mean, uh, when I was there at the at the Marketo, you know, the largest market in Africa and all of it. Is, is it all Africa or just East Africa? I'm not sure. I uh, I don't know. It's uh it's it's huge though. It's a bazaar. Yeah, it's, yeah. So it's like to be surrounded and just hear like another language. It was just you know. And the thing is, I wasn't able to distinguish between anything. But now after, I like said just pra really practicing the alphabet. Um, it, it helps out tremendously. It's really interesting for this particular language um, that learning the alphabet is important. I see the importance of learning the alphabet prior to just learning some different phrases. It's like yeah. you can learn different phrases, but you need to, you know, really get strong in the alphabet to, to even comprehend and pronounce those different phrases that you learn. Even historically, if you look at Ethiopia, what's the most important aspect? I always tell people, you know, they love that we ousted, uh, you know, mar monarchic Ethiopia ousted the original fascist menace of Italy under mm -hmm. Benito Mussolini. And before that, you know, with uh, King Gumberto in the late 1800s. Mm -hmm. But for me, <laughs> what's bigger than that is our writing. We know what led to that. If you really ask me what led to that, what led to it being besides you know liberia the the only independent and that's you know that was an american colony basically what was the only independent african nation if you ask me all the different factors you know people some people say it's christianity some people say it's the geography um, mm -hmm. the kind of highland territory that we have some people say it's dumb luck uh, because we've had you know i've mentioned to you in our class a few moments you know the italians um, the Ottomans and the Yemeni backing uh, a Somali and Harari group, uh, a Jewish or a pagan queen known as Yodit Gudit. We've had a few times where we've almost been wiped out, but we haven't. If you ask me what's Ethiopia's greatest and largest cultural achievement, it's the literature. It mm. is the writing. I think that is the thing. Some people, um, I think it's James uh, Scott. He's an agrarian uh, academic, he studies Southeast Asia and the kind of, uh, the yeoman, the farmers out there. And I think what he says, he especially studies people who've avoided taxes. I think he says like writing leads to tax collection. So <laughs> I think, I think wow. maybe, you know what? maybe, maybe, you know, the writing led to early state formation, you know, and that connects with, you know, church and state were one for, so long for 1600 years um maybe that's it but anyway wh whatever you know lens of analysis you look at it for me the most important thing about being ethiopian it's not waving a flag or the music or this that or the third it's the literature that's mm -hmm. what i'm personally most proud of and so um you know i'm, I'm glad you're you're on that journey uh, on a note, just to give people a specific example, you told me an anecdote the other day. Tell me that funny anecdote where you shocked some people who are not only native speakers, but also translators. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> the teacher is flexing the teacherhood. I love it. Um, yeah. So, um, so yeah. Yeah. So I, I believe it's the, um, it's the sixth column. Whenever a um, of of the alphabet, whenever a word ends with a letter from the sixth column, is cut in short. It's cut mm -hmm. short, and so 
um, yeah, we, we, you know, it's it's like uh, I, I'm not sure how many people know that, it, it, or it's just that's what you just know to do versus like actually know the reason for it. Like whenever you yeah. see that letter the, uh, on, the, on the seventh column at the end of a word, you're going to cut it short. And yeah, they were impressed. They didn't know that, you know? And um, yeah, once again, it's just like, shout out to the teacher. And I believe it's, it's like that probably for, even for English, you know, <laughs> because there's probably some rules that, in fact, interesting enough, my, my friend that's from Iran, um, whenever I send him a text message or something, he actually corrects my English. That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he actually corrects my English. Um uh, with that academic English, huh? Yes, yes. And I'm like, you know what? Yep, you're right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I so just, you don't you don't you don't like intend to do informal English sometimes when you text or that's funny. You know, I do, but I guess sometimes <laughs> I must I misspell things or he'll uh -huh. like you know, actually it's this way, you know, or you know, so it was just it is more of that yeah. I mean I say ain't and ignorant. And if somebody thinks I don't know that ain't ain't a word or that ignorant isn't ignorant, they don't know me. You know, if someone yeah, tried to correct yeah, me yeah, saying yeah. that. Yeah, I, I think it's one of those things when you're just intentional and you're just like, oh, I'm I'm um, sending you this particular message. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, um, actually, it's this is how you spell that word you're trying to do. Or yeah. this is actually how you say it when I wasn't trying to be um, informal. <laughs> Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What I was trying to be informal, but um, but yeah, yeah. I, I think it's when ever someone, anyone, like I guess, approach a language from a perspective of an academic way, um, that you're gonna learn, you know, quite a few more things than probably the native speakers would know, just mm -hmm. that just just to do just in general. Yeah, my my favorite MMA coach and jujitsu guy is uh, John Dana Hare. He was in a philosophy doctoral program when he dropped out to spend the rest of his life teaching jujitsu, and I believe he brought that academic mindset to that sport. Mm -hmm. And he's what he describes it as is he says the job of a coach or any teacher is to make implicit knowledge explicit. Mm -hmm. And and that's how he describes the kind of phenomenon you're talking about. Even if you look at your name, right? So Delton and Davis ends in a n or a s, yeah. which would be a sixth column. So yeah. if we wrote your name out, it would be, you know, a n for Delton at the end and a s for Davis at the end. Yeah. But we wouldn't say Delta n or yeah. Davis. N. Yes. We we would make it, you know, I, it's something I made up half silent. Yeah, um, but that's the behavior of the people. So we would use the N and the S, which are vocalized in our in our alphabet. Mm -hmm. But I guess through through custom, <laughs> we keep it we keep it uh, half silent, and it works with you with your name and and my name too. Hanok ends in a K, which is a six sound. Yeah. So it's 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 all around, and um, yeah, I, I I'm glad that you're at least seeing the fruits of that, and and maybe that's kind of uh propelling you forward this this has been a, a beautiful evening as always delton let's plug your youtube channel and do you have any sort of online spaces where your music uh is available or where people could could see oh, yeah. you you know your oh, thoughts yeah. or, or yeah. anything oh cool. um if you go to uh the organization that i have is uh kids drumming k-i-d-s-d-r-u-m-m-i-n-g dot org um, that's the organization I started. Take kids on a world progression journey, mixing, um, you know, educating, you know, participants about, about the rhythmic world around us. Um, my YouTube channel. Um, I don't have enough subscribers yet to get my own domain yet. So uh, you can find it. I believe just Delton Davis. <laughs> You're gonna see probably some other YouTube people, but hopefully you can see my picture and like, okay, that's the guy I saw. Yeah, uh, we'll throw the link up too. We'll throw the oh, link yeah, up cool, too, but cool, it's good cool. good for people to hear it as well. Yeah, cool. Uh, Instagram, I believe, is Delton Percussion, and um, yeah, and Facebook, I think, is just Delton Davis. Yeah. 